much as I'm enjoying working on this, we need to be somewhere else. And this is more like it. The thaumaturgical field. This is where we are going to be working today. I've been putting this off because this is scaring me. It's not something I'm used to. I have to build a big tree here. <laughs> yeah, that's nervous laughter. Oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah. That's the tree farm. I'll stop letting myself get distracted. I've got to get started. I have sketches I've done of large trees. I have photos I've got off the internet of large trees. I'm trying to remember how the big trees I've been around look. And this is petrifying me. <laughs> we want an entrance here. So, yeah, I'm mapping it out in dirt first. So I suppose the first thing to do is to get this worked out. Uh, that might be too big. I want it to come over this way and then join up down there. Actually, that's not too bad. Okay. All right. So we bring it up here. And this will all be done in wood and logs and slabs and stairs so it won't have this sort of chunky. I think I want to take that out. Yeah, I definitely do. Ah. Oh. This is going to be a lot, and I mean a lot, of trial and error. So, I think we'll switch to replay mod. <laughs> Wish me luck.
there's the tree. I swapped out the birch fence for cobble for the branches because the blonde wood with the grey bark just looked too weird. And I think also the sort of double railing fence looked strange too. I think it looks much better now. This tree may or may not end up with leaves. I think I might just leave it barren. All this has got a lot of work to do. I'm going to encase the tree or surround the tree with basic sacred geometry mystic symbols. I mean it's nothing deep it's it's just going right to the beginnings of sacred geometry back to the standard forms and if you're wondering what on earth is sacred geometry <laughs> it was an area of study that was started by Plato and the Pythagoreans back in ancient Greece whoops oh, I don't need that let's fix that and it was basically the idea that forms had significant meaning that numbers and geometry were inextricably tied together and represented truths about the universe. And you then get writers in the early Christian church like Augustine who take the Pythagorean studies of number and adapt them to Christian teachings. I know this all sounds like new age mumbo jumbo but we're talking about stuff that is thousands of years old so it's not new age mumbo jumbo it's old age mumbo jumbo <laughs> I happen to really really like sacred geometry it was something that I did at uni um, I was particularly looking at the books of Lindisfarne and Kells and how sacred geometry underpinned the carpet pages, the decorations, how they added extra meaning to insular manuscripts. Which meant I had to go back and look at the ancient Greek stuff as well. It was so much fun. Some of it's just completely bonkers. But it was fun and geometry is such an interesting topic. I never liked maths as a kid. I never liked geometry in high school. If I'd been told geometry could tell you a story, I'd have loved that. I'd have paid a lot more attention. Also, if I'd have known that all you need to draw all sorts of geometric shapes is a straight edge, not a ruler, and a set of compasses, I'd have found that endlessly fascinating. Uh, you can go there. So, there's law behind this tree. There were a group of people called the Wayfinders, and I've got some law written, and it sounds like, I don't know, it sounds like I've gone completely mad, but I will at some point, hopefully in the next week, make a little video about them, and I'll read out the demented law that I've written. But basically, the upshot of it is, is that par the Pathfinders find places where the fabric between worlds, the fabric of reality, is weak. And they fray that reality, that fabric, until they can make a tear. And then they can make a doorway that goes through to the space between worlds so that they can walk the paths between dimensions. Now, why on earth am I doing this? Because we need... A mystic means of getting back to the area that is known as Vastan 1. There's going to be a portal in that tree. So what I'm doing at the moment is I am laying out a circle. Because circles represent the number 1. And the number 1 is considered the perfect number. The number one was considered indivisible. There was nothing smaller you could have than one because zero wasn't a concept. Now, zero as a concept didn't come to the West until about 1200. Fibonacci is credited with introducing it, but he got it from Arabic traders who got it from Indian mathematicians who were exploring the concept certainly around the 5th century. And when zero did finally make it to the West, it was banned largely on religious reasons. 
but up until you had zero, you couldn't divide one. Now, to a modern mind, you're sitting there going, well, of course you can divide one. You've got halves and thirds and what have you. To an ancient Greek mind and to a mind up to the medieval, you couldn't divide one. If you cut one in half, you didn't end up with two halves. You ended up with two ones. And I've had this argument with my kids. They go, that's just stupid. Well, it sounds stupid to us, but it wasn't stupid to the pre-zero mind. Your two ones might be half the size of your original one, but they're still two ones. So one was a perfect number, and because the circle is perfect, it's got no beginning or end, it's the geometric representation of the number one. So the wayfinders have found this tree with a fabric rent in it. They think it's perfect, so we've got circles. The circle, the number one, is also representative of the whole universe and also of creation, whether you think that's a Christian creation, an ancient Greek creation, whatever else you think it is. Oh yeah, I like that. The cobble branches are definitely the way to go. The birch ones just looked weird. I've not done a large scale custom tree before, so I was very nervous about this, but I'm quite happy with it now. Okay, so let's talk about our next shape. Our next shape is a square and you can probably guess what number a square represents. If you say four you'll be correct. <laughs> it's not hard is it? <laughs> now a square represents the earth amongst other things. Why does it represent the earth? Well, we've got the four corners of the earth. You've got the four winds. You've got the four directions. We've got the square. The square is also, like the circle, a number of perfection. Because it is a number of order. All right, so we've got our circle. We've got our square. I'm now going to put another circle inside this square. So we're going to have what is called a squared circle. Now in Greek and medieval sacred geometry, the squared circle was a really important shape. It was the shape upon which everything else was built. You're trying to make complex designs and things, you start with a squared circle because you can get every other shape out of it, you can get rectangles out of it, you can get different circular divisions, you can get mandolas, all sorts of things. And the squared circle was seen as, uh, how do I put it? The squared circle represents the imposition of order upon the formless void. So for the wayfinders, this is them expressing how they put order upon the space between worlds, the space where they make paths and walk, which creates sort of, I suppose, sort of wormholes between places is probably the way we put it. Yeah, I know, this is absolutely barking. But Fix said he wanted mystical, and I went into overdrive. <laughs> So there's our squared circle. It ideally should have half circles overlapping at the centre of the tree. But once you get into this scale, that sort of detail gets a bit congested. If I had lovely thin lines, I'd certainly be doing that. Now, if I'm using Christian sacred geometry, I'd have a cross through the middle of this. The Pythagoreans also did that. You could build all sorts of things if you divided something into what we call quarters. I'm putting in a different sort of division into four 
this center square is being divided on the diagonal because I want to integrate triangles into this. Triangles in sacred geometry, you can guess what number they're for. They're for the number three. Three is the most stable of the numbers. It is the most stable of the numbers. It is also the number that represents the passage between the transcendent and manifest realms. That is between the physical and uh, spiritual realms, probably. Now, if I was going to go all out, I'd actually have yeah, a right angle triangle. Oh no, I've run out of crying obsidian. Ah. And I haven't quite managed to finish my triangle. Oh, that's annoying. And I think I've cleaned out the storage unit. Mmm. Well, anyway, once I get that, we will have squares, we will have circles, we will have triangles, we will have representatives of the number one, the number four, and the number three. If I actually put a right angle triangle in, we'd also have representatives of the number two and five because you've got the sides that are two and three and the hypotenuse is five. And five represents all the people of a world because two and three are female and male. And this is just the simple stuff of sacred geometry. It gets really convoluted and complicated and just downright bonkers. I love it. The portal is going to be down here. I dug this long tunnel because it was supposed to be in a big cave. I don't think I've got time to build the cave because this portal has to open in in several days. Oh, two, three, something like that. Probably one by the time I get this out. And I don't have time to build, to dig a big cave. So I think the portal will be here. And this isn't going to be... The, the idea is the portal's been closed for a thousand years and for some reason it's reopened now, which gives the people here access to a land that they've largely forgotten about. It's gone into myth status or legend status. The wayfinders were a bit secretive. You know, they kept themselves to themselves. It's not there for you, it's there for them. But for some reason, it's about to open up. Excuse me, just peering out from behind the chest. There's been some pillagers wandering around. Okay, I'm back after hours and hours and hours. All right, excuse me, hiding behind the chests. It's those guys at the moment, but they have had friends wandering around out here. They seem to be gone. And that raises the question of these chests. <laughs> Remember how I said I don't have time to dig out the cave? Guess what? <laughs> uh, the top row, some of it's a bit full. Most of the rest of these are just absolutely chock-a-block. But... We've got this finish. I blighted the circle. It's what I always wanted to do. I actually wanted to have the circle partly broken and then gradually bring it in, but that would have involved me getting this tree finished a lot earlier. So we've just got an intact circle. So imagine this was all busted. The purple wasn't there or it was partly covered or something. And now suddenly it's all clear and we've got the tree. And all this is spawn proof. I'm going to take, yeah, I'm going to take my torches off my hotbar because I've got dynamic lighting turned on with Optifine. So let's go down. Down we go. And yet yeah, this is all spawn proof. So down to the very dark tunnel. All the way down and around. And then there's this. And you have to excuse that. That's a command block. It's going to go under there so people can just press that button and end up back at Vastin 1. That's what this is for, Vastin 1. But I don't have time to dig out a cave. Guess what? I've spent 17 
18 hours over the last couple of days digging out this cave <laughs> and making that portal. <laughs> Sorry, that's hysterical laughter. Uh, where the andesite and the diorite meet, there's actually an abandoned mine. It comes through in a couple of spots, I think, just over there. Uh, one comes up through the floor. That's all been blocked off. And if we have a look, the geometry for the portal down here is different to the geometry for the tree up there. There's a reason. We've got the circle. We've got a square, so we've got creation and perfection, we have the world, order and perfection, and then we've got another square laid over the top. The square is of the same dimensions, so we've got two squares overlaid. That's multiple worlds. And the two squares join together, I'll pop this back on, if you follow these lines, it forms an octagon. An octagon stands for the number 8. And the two overlaid squares, the circle, the octagon, signifies the bridge between the worlds and the heavens. So we've got the passage between the manifest and spiritual worlds upstairs. So that's saying, you know, this tree, it'll lead you to other places. And now we have the actual portal surrounded by symbols that say this is the bridge to other worlds or through this portal more to the point is the bridge to other worlds and the portal is basically a water flow with crying obsidian behind it I quite like how it looks and why have we got all this water here because water was one of those areas that could be a place of breaking down between worlds people went into water they didn't come back they didn't find their bodies had they drowned or had they merely found a way to the other side? So you've got caves, you've got water, you've got tree hollows. This place encompasses all three. This caves, water, tree hollows, I haven't made that up. That was actually beliefs amongst some ancient peoples. I know certainly the Celts held places like that sacred. But, you know, anywhere that's dangerous that people have the potential to go in and not come out, did end up with mysterious stories circling around them to do with travelling to other realms. And I think next time I will be working at the gatehouse, which of course means I need to go resource gathering again or at least ratting through the storage area. So you know the drill, there's end cards on the screen now to some more of my material so that you can have fun while I'm off doing the boring stuff. I'll see you later. Bye!